Well, um, good evening, good evening, good, good, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, great to see you here. It's great to see that so many people have lined up to participate in this, in this uh, event that we're all looking forward to. You're, more, you're very warmly welcome to, um, to, to, this, uh, to this event. Uh, I'm Håkan Gomer, I'm the chairman of the UK Friends of the SSE, uh, which was set up a couple of years ago uh, to, to uh, more directly cater to the, to the interests of the SSE alumni uh, resident in the UK. So we're working very closely with uh, the alumni organization at, uh, at the school uh, and with the hope and with the intention of, of achieving some level of stability and continuity in this world of crazy change that we're all living through right now. Now, uh, we're, uh, the, uh, this whole effort is, being co is orchestrated by uh, Jessica O'Mary, who is uh, head of uh, development and uh, alumni relations at the, uh, at, the, at the school. She's based uh, in um, Stockholm with her, with her, with her team. And we're excited, uh, Jessica, to uh, learn your perspective uh, on, um, on uh, and, and priorities for the uh, alumni organization going forward. And we're, we're, all, we're, all, we're all set to intently listen to, uh, to your, your, your introduction. Jessica O'Mary. Thank you, Hawken. Hi, everyone. Like Hawken said, we are thrilled to, um, that so many of you are able to join today. So as Head of Development and Alumni Relations at the Stockholm School of Economics, I want to just provide some brief background information about some of the changes that are taking place regarding the SSE Alumni Network. So SSE aims to support you, our alumni, in your lifelong learning and through the building of your professional and personal networks. Many of us find ourselves looking for new ways of working during these times and that also applies to the way SSE is supporting and continuing to build the alumni network. In the past, the network functioned mostly through in-person seminars, reunions, and events. But now, in going forward, we see the increased value in providing webinars, videos, and articles that are available to all alumni, regardless of your location and stage of career. We hope you've taken advantage of some of these tools that support your growth in learning, which have been made available to you through the alumni newsletter and on the SSE website. We're also working with the alumni hubs in the US, the UK, Germany, and Hong Kong to actively create content, which is available to you all. The geographical boundaries that previously existed have broken down, meaning the SSE alumni network is now more global than it's ever been before. So now turning to today's webinar. Matthias Axelson will offer a brief lecture, which will be followed by a Q&A session facilitated by Andreas Scherling, who's an SSE alum, managing director in the UK for Flixbus, and a trustee of the UK Friends of SSE. Few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Type in your question, and then send it to Andreas Scherling by selecting his name in the pull down menu. We've muted everyone in order to facilitate a seamless webinar experience for all. However, please feel free to turn on your camera so everyone can see the participants. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Matthias Axelson, who's also an SSE alum, having received his PhD from SSE. He's now a researcher at the House of Innovation and a lecturer at SSE Executive Education. Matthias has built a career-long interest in the subject of innovation. It started with a deep and intensive study of a tech venture from within Saab, and which was developed and commercialized as a joint venture. Many years later, he now has a book in the pipeline on exactly that kind of hidden potential. So I'll turn it on over to Matthias. Thank you, yes again. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure meeting you, although online. Um, great to see so many faces here on the screen. Um, realize your hidden potential. What is that all about? 
imagine that you some years ago, say 10, 15 years ago, would have been working for a well-known publishing house. Imagine that you had this uh, workshop with some uh, colleagues and think, you know, I heard about this company, it's called Spotify. They are streaming music. I've been thinking a little bit, maybe we could start stream, streaming our books. We could have these great uh, actors read the books and we could distribute them online. How about that? Because we have all the authors, we have all the contracts, we have all the know-how, we know the readers. We just have to add this channel. How difficult could that be? Do you think it would have happened? Probably not because the resistance internally in the organization will probably have been great. And that's usually the case. And there are many words for that. It's sometimes called the innovator's dilemma, by, which was formulated first by Clayton Christensen, a Harvard um, professor. And the idea is that it's so difficult for an established organization to see the potential of what it actually could achieve. So it fails and misses the opportunities and instead they are disrupted by new entrants. And this was actually what happened to, to, uh, to a great Swedish publishing house. It's called um, Nordstedts. At the time, some plus 10 years ago, when they were, could have done this journey, starting up or creating a, a streaming service for books, another company, Storytel, was established, a startup. Some years later, that startup bought the more than 100 years old Nordstedts. It's a fantastic story of what could actually happen when you're sort of too late and acting on the opportunities that you have. And the idea with hidden potential that it resides in an organization, um, it is it's not a new idea. We can see it all the time. However, it has not really been packaged and addressed to the extent it should be, I think. And one of the greatest examples of our time of the hidden potential is Amazon Web Services. I mean, I think most of you are familiar with that brand. It's the largest part of Amazon today. It's hugely profitable, the word says. And um, it was actually established as a coincidence almost, according to at least some, that Amazon had server Slack capacity. And they thought maybe we could rent it to other companies because, you know, we have this lack capacity and why not make some money from it? And that started the journey towards what we have today, which is the largest or perhaps the second largest uh, cloud service provider, depends on how you count, and uh, a huge part of Amazon. And I would like to argue that this kind of hidden potential, perhaps not of the grand scale potential or like, Amazon is in many, you can be found in many, many organizations. Um, and in order to address this, I've been writing this book. It's actually possible to order today online. It's called Dual Potential in, and Hidden Potential in English. And um, in order to have a translator, I will encourage all of you who speak Swedish to buy it because then the publishing house will actually have it translated to English too. Um, this is the agenda. Uh, we should talk about, um, uh, should we really anticipate accelerated change today, um, given the corona crisis uh, and the mega trends that we see? And what is established companies' uh, hidden potential? How can they address it? And what does it really take? So, should we anticipate accelerated change today? Well, we can all read about the sort of the immediate effects of the corona crisis in, in, um, in media, right? So this is nothing new, but it's worthwhile considering it, I think. We can see the changes in customer behavior. There's an obvious decline of the physical retail. But the question is, will that decline continue after the crisis? So we need to sort of start thinking what will happen next. Um, there is a boom of e-commerce, will that last? There is a change in, for instance, 70 plus, how they are using the net now in order to, to purchase uh, on, online. And will that last? Because and that's a com completely new uh, group of people who have moved online to a large scale. 
And then they have the changes in work life. Many of us are working from home. Do we need the office anymore? Or what kind of offices do we need and, and want? And this has obviously a huge consequences for commercial retail. So it's a really, really huge question, financially speaking. And there are obviously great business opportunities in that too, for all those who can provide services for people working home or perhaps providing services for new kinds of office solutions. And then we have the, the traveling example. I think many of us are, are, are considering when it's really necessary to travel because we have all learned to use Zoom and other tools in order to communicate and also deal with quite complex tasks. Because it was previously said that, you know, if you should do something really complex, like developing a new product, etc., you need to meet people face to face. And that's probably still true if you're really gonna do something really, really complex because you need to understand the person and develop the personal relationships. Yet, uh, to a great extent, we can use these tools and they will develop rapidly we can assume since the money are pouring into these sectors like Zoom and other companies who are providing these tools. So when will traveling be necessary? Um, that, that's an important question if you're in the airline or hotel business, right? So, and we have city life, which might be even like more down the road, a long-term uh, area to keep an eye on. Because what kind of transportation will we need? Will the sort of psychological effects of using the subway will they last giving sort of the the risk for the epidemic or will we con continue go back using the transportations that we have been using when all this is over perhaps who knows but there's another aspect of this like relating to the mega trend of urbanization because we have, have been told for many years and we have seen the pat patterns in the figures that we use urbanization to sort of work in the dense city areas right like London, like Stockholm, and other large cities. Now, that's really expensive, especially like for young couples moving into these cities. Um, and so we can ask ourselves, does the new tools we're using, the new attitudes towards the office, etc., will that open up for new attitudes for where we should live? So maybe you could live like 20 kilometers, 200 kilometers from Stockholm instead of living nearby Stockholm, having a cheaper house, still working in Stockholm the way you, could, you, the way you couldn't have done before. That's just as one example. That would influence transportation, which is a huge sector. And then we have logistics, of course, related to e-commerce. And the last mile is still a problematic thing, both from an environmental perspective and also from a commercial perspective, because it's difficult to make money from that. And it also relates what kind of speed will we demand as customers? Is it instant delivery? Okay, that's a huge toll for the environment and also for, for commercially. So how will the business models look like for logistics? It's a really huge and interesting area, I think. And all this will be influenced on how we deal with the, the crisis. So, uh, it would be interesting to see your view on these megatrends. These are just some examples, and I think the most striking one right now everyone talking about is the office. Do we need the office or not? So let's have a poll to see what you think, because Twitter said this weekend that it will be optional for their employees forever whether to go back to the office or not. So the question is, do you think we need the office? Will the demand change? What is your take on that? Okay, interesting to see the results falling in here. Most of you, uh, well, I shouldn't say perhaps because I might influence your voting, but uh, we have one really clear um, um, winner, if you like, here. 50% um, uh, are actually now is getting, we're stopping the close here. So like 51% to say, we estimate that we're gonna be a decrease. Okay, it's easy to make that assumption. I would vote for that too. Uh, we cannot be really sure, of course, if this was sort of, we will have the same uh, estimation like half a year or a year from now, but this is an interesting indication. So if some of you are working for commercial real estate, well, maybe you should uh, take an extra, uh, put an extra eye on this and reflect on what the consequences might be. Because these have huge financial consequences for all of us, not the least for our pension funds are invested in, in commercial real estate to a great extent, because it has been a safe investment, right? This is really interesting. So this is one example. I don't wanna you know, say that things are gonna accelerate due to, change are gonna accelerate due to the corona crisis, but it makes sense to assume that. 
And that is, will make many companies come up in the position that we need to reorient or come up with a new position. And that's where sort of the importance of the, of the, of the hidden potential comes in. Now, you will just briefly mention some of the mega trends that we need to ask ourselves, will they accelerate? And the previous examples are partly addressing this, but let's focus on digitalization. Um, we have now, the, this month, uh, 5G will be introduced in Stockholm, and it will rapidly be spread around the globe. That will lead to the Internet of Things revolution, some people think, and it makes sense to assume that. And that will generate huge amounts of data. And what values will be created from that? That's a really open-ended question, right? But it's a huge area for innovation. This is just one example. But we see digitalization is changing many industries. And I think that for many established organizations, one of the major threats comes from the platform revolution. Like companies like Spotify, like Amazon and others are creating sort of a web-based a platform solution, and under that they are integrating the established ones. So we can see that in, in, in some obvious industries, like for instance, like music. Uh, we can see storytelling books as an as example that I started with. However, will we see the same thing when it comes to automotive and, and transportation? Well, uh, it's reasonable to, to think that in a way. Uh, and I assume personally that the boom or the huge investor interest in, in Voy and other electric scooter companies is not about the electric scooter business. It's about the, being part of the experimentation of new business models for transportation in large city areas. Because what will be sort of the business model that will actually determine how we're going to use our cars or will we own cars at all in the future? More of that is sort of a... Uh, up for grabs now. And so that's you know, just some examples of how digitalization is gradually changing everything and we're having a fundamental impact on, on many established industries. So we need, we need to start to re reorganize here. And one example that I came across here is Klaus, the, the harvester and agriculture manufacturer. Uh, a really interesting case, I think, because they some eight years ago or so thought that you know, we can see these platforms emerging in other sectors. Will that happen in the agri-tech sector too? Well, maybe. Do we want to be sort of subordinated to a platform producer, a platform company? Or would we rather have the platform ourselves so we can sort of take the control and keep, the, keep up the, the, the profit levels that we like? and so rather orchestrate the largest ecosystem of different actors instead of being subordinated. So they started developing that farmer network solution instead, combining you know, the, the access to, to the wheat stock exchange in Chicago, uh, weather uh, channels, insurance companies, whatever you like, and including, of course, their own machinery, their harvesters, et cetera, and integrating them with internet tools, GPS, etc. So the sort of the farmer have this everything on the screen, what it needs in order to coordinate its business. And that's really an example of how a fairly small company compared to many other industrial companies are stepping up and saying, you know, we are not going to give up, we're going to be a platform company too. And utilizing their strength in a way, their hidden potential, if you like, being strong in that sector in order to sort of moving to, 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 to the platform business too. And then we combine this with sustainability. And when we see sustainability, um, lots talk about it, obviously, and lots of greenwashing uh, for sure. But there is a change, I think, uh, during the last few years in the attitude. We can see it in, a in, in how many companies are addressing it. Uh, we can see it in the concept of shared value, where it's sort of being popularized, where that you should both make money and do good as a company in order to be sustainable. That has impact for the way you can recruit talent. You cannot only be so too commercial, you need to be a part for society too. And it was interesting to see, I think it was August last year, that a foundation of, of, of several uh, large American companies, they sort of agreed May, whether it's lip service or not remains to be seen, but they said that we are not only there for profit. It's all for all, it's not only shareholders, it's for all stakeholders. 
So we are not only going for money, we're going to also be we're there for our suppliers, our employees. We are there for, for the customers and society at large. So this might be a fundamental value shift underway. Will that be influenced by Corona crisis for good or bad? Well, who knows? But anyway, it's interesting. So if we combine these changes, the, the technological development and sort of the sustainability trend, what kind of new business models would be necessary to develop if you would like to thrive in the years to come? I think that is one of the major uh, questions that managers should ask now as we move forward uh, and look forward to, to sort of the world after the crisis. So the question then, I think many managers should ask, is your core business fit for the future? And as you understand, this is a rhetoric question. Uh, it's hard to, to be very confident unless, except for a few exceptions to argue that it is really, really fit for the future. You might, might be sufficient to do incremental changes, but in some cases you need to do more radical changes like Klaus did with their, uh, their platform business. But it's all, not all about being sort of the negative story. So great opportunities here too, to focus on the opportunities and the strengths that you have. And actually, why not create a new business if you could? You don't have to be afraid or resistant doing it. To try to do it and go for the business opportunities that you actually have. So it's not only about you know avoiding threats. It's actually a positive story here too. So what is established companies that uh, companies have? Uh, the, what is the hidden potential? I will share you walk you through this model here. It has two dimensions: complexity, which means um, how many components are related to each other. By components, I mean it often it is often knowledge. It is it could be machinery, equipment, etc., data, but it's all often have one knowledge component with it. So high complexity means that you know there are many different parts involved, and low means that there are a few, of course. Then it's where is the where is the hidden potential to be found? Well, it can be found internally within the organization, of course, but it can also be found externally in the intersection between your company and other companies, in the relationship with customers, with partners, etc. So it's not only something that's internal, it's important to recognize that, I think. So here, low complexity and internal. This is the, what I call the rough diamonds. It's assets that you have that can be utilized in other contexts outside the current core to create value. And one is the other examples that Jessica mentioned in the introduction here is Saab, who had this um, algorithm for 3D maps for military use. And they thought, could this have some kind of commercial application? Long story short, they started developing it and it eventually became a company that had a rapid growth and it was called C3 Technologies, and they sold it to Apple for one and a half billion sec after a few years uh, of, of, of development. It was a fantastic deal at that time. And the, and the story said that the technology is in our pockets now because the 3D function that we have in, in Apple uh, telephone, iPhones, um, the story says, you know, Apple would never confirm that obviously, but that is uh, developed in lean shopping in Sweden. Isn't one example how we sort of can basically take an algorithm or a single patent to do something really cool with. Um, then you have this position here um, behind the curtains. It's more fussy. It's more difficult to grasp. It's not like a single patent, rather bundle of patents perhaps, but more likely, and I think this is really interesting given the Internet of Things development, it is the data being generated. And we all, we all large companies have fantastic amounts of customer data. You know, all these data lakes, when they might be more or less uh, chaotic, you don't really know what you have in some cases. But if you sort of have order in the, in the, in the data, you can start really exploring what business potential is there. So I think there's a lots of lots of hidden potential in, in the data that many large organizations, only even mid-sized companies have. Uh, and it should be utilized for, for creating values. And I think just one example here that we will see construction companies are in a really interesting position as we move forward, because 
uh, with the Internet of Things, there will be sensors all, all over the place. And one said, you know, that the walls, do you think the walls will be stupid in the future? Probably not. They will more have more uh, counting capacity than you have. Uh, so, so what data will be generated sort of just in our buildings and how can we utilize that for create values. That's some, so many companies, I assume, construction companies have the potential to become information companies, management companies too. All right, external matchmaking here. It's about seeing what do you have that is not, you know, super complex perhaps. You might have some advantages that you can combine with other companies, but you need to see those combinations to, 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 to have a go. And exploring that, what can, and another example is that if your companies have uh, if you, your, your customer have, have, have some needs that they are not really capable of addressing, but you see them, you can integrate forward, you can take part of that, uh, or, or their need, fill their needs by seeing it in you with new eyes, building on the assets that you have. So it's a matchmaking combination. It's very much about creative thinking in order to see, to see it. Okay, a mobilizing mission. That's about you know, st seeing a greater challenge or potential for that matter in society and stepping forward and addressing it. Uh, and one example of that that I think is really interesting comes from Autoliv. And we could see in the news this winter that the CEO wrote that they say, we, know, we are in the business of saving lives. It's a mission in itself, but we're in the mission of sort of saving life for those who are traveling. Well, how about we extend that to say we're going to save lives of those who are outside the cars, for instance, those who have been run over, those who are sort of in the bicycle accidents, etc. So it's a large, all those who are sort of moving around in the cities, they need to be saved too. No company can take on that challenge themselves. But by stepping forward and saying we have capacities, we have some hidden potential in our production facilities, in our R&D know-how that we can use in order to address this challenge or this opportunity for that matter. But we need others to follow so we can combine resources with them. Um, this is, this opening, is opening up a new area for innovation, really. So it's not a great space for innovation. It takes muscles, it takes vision, a great leadership to address it, but it's definitely possible. So these are sort of the different, archetypes of hidden potential. Um, so now the question is to you and where, where you are working, where do you see hidden potential? So let's have a poll. Uh, this is so surprising. <laughs> this is really, really interesting. I don't know, know really what the organizations you're representing, but <laughs> I would like to know because this it, it is it's re really, really fascinating. Um, as we move forward here, um, I will will tell you soon. Well, now have we got the results here. Mobilizing mission. You see the greatest but hidden potential for in your organizations uh, in, in that area. And that is fantastic, right? For the business opportunity in that space is huge. It's perhaps a little bit more difficult to take on compared to the others, but it, it is really, really interesting and really encouraging too, because if you dare to go down that road, I mean, the values you can create for shareholders and society at large, and then your own, it's, it's, it's really, really interesting and it could be great. And then we have, of course, matchmaking. It is a great potential, I think, you know, to see creative examples of that. In Sweden, we have Mothem, for instance, who, who is also a distributor of groceries. And we have Klaus Olsson, who is a retail company. Klaus Olsson bought a share of them in order to sort of get access to an, e an internet uh, e-commerce platform. But the combination of them are interesting too, right? So they're finding each other to see this creative mat matchmaking is, is a great area. And behind the curtain of, of, of two, I mean, obviously, uh, I guess several of you are thinking of the data that you might have that you can utilize in, 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 in other areas. And rough diamonds, yeah, uh, it was um, the, the, the less likely, which is a bit surprising, but perhaps, uh, perhaps, I, I'm now speculating, but it could be the case that we assume that the rough diamonds, they need to be patterns or similar, right? 
and not that many companies have like uh, patents to the extent that they have this most more fussy know-how the potential in the in the in the data etc that they can utilize so this is interesting thanks for for participating okay um, let's move on When we think about the hidden potential and we start sort of about how can we sort of commercialize it, it makes sense to go to where the customer is, right? To focus on the customer needs and explore the, what, what, what pains are they having or what pleasures would they like to, to receive? And how can we address them? And this is an innovation journey. And this is, that's the reason why there is a gap between these two arrows because it's not in obvious how we should close it, because in that case, there wouldn't be a hidden potential, it would be an obvious potential, right? Or perhaps no potential at all, because someone else had addressed it already. And that is the, what is in super important to think of when you're working with innovation. It is not there for a good reason. It, it takes some effort to discover it. And the more kind of radical innovation you're going for, the newer things, services, or business models you would like to create, the harder you need to work because it is less obvious. You have your assets, you can understand the customer needs, you really need to work hard to understand the customer needs, but then, then you do that. And when you start taking on the hidden potential and thinking, well, what do we have that could meet those needs? Like Saab did when they start thinking, could we use this algorithm for other uses than the military? And they eventually became these applications for Apple. It's an example of that journey. And they call this the opportunity gap, and the whole idea is to close that gap. And that requires that you're good at working with business innovation. So what does it take then to close that gap? Well, first of all, let's go back to the innovation dilemma or the innovators dilemma, perhaps, that Christensen formulated. Um, and it's, it's the following. Um, many, I assume many of you are familiar with this. If you come up with some good new ideas, um, like the, the, the example I had about this uh, great uh, publishing house. What's usually is going to happen is that someone says, you know, yeah, we should take all this, but um, we don't have the budget right now. Or uh, maybe you can start a little small project perhaps, and but then it starts to grow and say, no, we don't have the time. Maybe you can work with this, but do it on Friday afternoon and nothing much happens, right? So that is one of the key challenges. The core business, which we always need to protect and work with, because that's where we are making money today, it has sort of the, the disadvantage of being like a black hole. It absorbs the light of the new things because it takes the time, the effort, the money, uh, and gives little space for creating something new. And then, so, so it's important to keep that in mind, that exploration is another creature. It is about closing the gap of thinking creatively, using different sources of inspiration and, and setting out to really, really having an innovation journey. And that's another way of working. It does not fin fit your regular um, um, measurements, your KPIs, your way of de making decisions. It is sort of not made for that. It is more, it takes another more exploratory project light organization if you like, in order to, I'll come back to that later on here, what it really takes. So it's important to recognize that this di dilemma, it's in present in any established organization. Just admit it, you cannot avoid it, just live with it. The only trick is to organize for exploration and having exploration going on outside the core business, which it should focus on exploitation. Don't try to mix those two in the same organization because you, then you will fail being innovative. Okay, and the reason is why you fail or what it takes to succeed with exploration can be sort of summarized of these two dimensions. Uh, in order to take on something new in the relationship to an established organization, you need power to act. And what do I mean with power? I mean, it's a fussy concept perhaps, but the obvious example is that you need a mandate to take the decisions necessary. And you also need the budgetary means, right? And just to give you an example, I mean, starting to solve quite a lot, and they are really good at how to, to go for new opportunities. The head of the corporation in, within Saab, who is responsible for, for dealing with new business opportunities, Saab Corporate Ventures, 
that person has a larger budget mandate to make a decision on a single day than the CEO of the whole sub group has. In the, because the, the speed is of essence. If you see an opportunity, uh, finding a new partner, that you should make a deal, you need to make those decisions. So they have sort of rigged the whole management system for that. So that's one example. But going back to the more strategic level, perhaps a board or CEO level, you need a policy for going for exploration. You need to make that decision clear. And you know, back in the days, 60s, 70s, perhaps 80s, it was possible to have you know, projects going on in the basement of the companies, pe people experimenting with new stuff. This is, for instance, a story about how AstraZeneca took off with the low circum medicine, or how the whole story about Ericsson's successes for a decade or so in mobile telephones uh, was more or less basement uh, activities that the management didn't like or didn't know about. Uh, was that was taking place but this that's more difficult today because the organizations are more streamlined they are more anorectic in many places and the the control economic control systems that we have developed means that this less capacity for sort of hiding development money which means that the, you need the policy it needs to be explicit you need to give the have the policy give the mandate give the budgetary measurement the budgetary and also finally you need the kpis you need other kpis for going for a new business it you should not expect a new business initiative to to respond to the existing kpis of the core because if you do you will start measuring it in the wrong way and well, that's the best way to kill it right so 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 we need so to, to have this we need to build in the power system that is sort of sufficient given our innovation ambitions otherwise the hidden potential will remain hidden. And then learning outside core, it, this, is, this is the other dimension. It means that an organization, it goes for all organizations, it has its culture, has its management systems, uh, it has its, um, all the, how, how things are done, what is right, what is wrong, what gives the status, etc. That influences our thinking, that influences what we can see, what we can perceive. So if you really would like to you know, see whether you have a hidden potential or not, you need to sort of open up, think outside the box that we live in. So this is like, you know, not normative or this doesn't necessarily, it's a bad thing, but just recognize we are all sort of living in different boxes, but with the help of different tools, help of collaboration with external parties, et cetera, we can lift ourselves and see new opportunities outside where we are. And that's a starting point or learning outside core. But then you obviously need to organize for it too. You need to have people and combinations of people who really can drive learning because it's all about discovering a new business opportunity. It's a long journey of learning because it's about closing the gap that I was talking about previously. And that takes some time and it takes um, effort in order to do that. But at the end of the day, the learning will lead to a new business model because that is sort of the, the end of what we are aiming for when we're talking about hidden potential. Going from the idea of a hidden potential to a new business model that creates value for customers and generates profits for, for our company. So how to organize then for business innovation in order to realize the hidden potential? And then I will share this four block with you. The first, I have been touching on this a little bit before when we talk about power. So this autonomy, it's very much about being to the degree that the organization responsible for realizing the hidden potential can act and make decisions on its own, or whether it's sort of dependent of decisions in the, in the established line organization. And the other aspect here is whether the organization is internal or external. And obviously, I mean, th these are archetypes, they are principal conceptual way of thinking. They are mixes between, they can be internal slash external or it could be a joint venture. So the different combinations here. But for the sake of thinking in principle, we have these four types here. This is quite popular concept, innovation labs. Uh, and many, so perhaps some of you are working in innovation labs and maybe you will not agree with what I'm just going to say now. But the, my view from having started a couple of different innovation labs in established organizations, they are usually uh, two, three, four levels below the CEO, which means that the autonomy, the power to make decisions is 
fairly low. The budget is often quite small and it's really, really internal. And quite often, it could be a combination of internal and external people, you might recruit to some people, but it's often embedded in the, in the, in the mother organization. Uh, which means that you might have some interesting concepts going on, but you will not be able to scale it. You have no muscles in order to do it, because then you will need to go to the line organization and they say, you know, sorry guys, we don't have the budget for investing in this. Then you have the skunk works. I mean, the, uh, the, the term skunk works comes from the military industry. Lockheed Martin developed a new fighter plane back in the 50s, I think it was. Uh, and they used a uh, highly autonomous organization for that. So that's, that's where the ter terms come from. But it's used in the other organizations. And I came across an interesting case of the Arbetsförmedling in Sweden, which is the unemployment agency. And they have this job tech which is an independent organization. They have an office downtown in Gamla Stan in Stockholm, working independently and creating a matchmaking function, integrating different matchmaking organizations through a new platform, which is really innovative. Uh, and, but, and that's a really in interesting example of a skunk work. Uh, and if an, an agency can do it, a government agency, I think any organization can do it because, you know, they have really been able to navigate the bureaucratic obstacles there. It's really, really interesting. So, and then we have this, an incubator is quite popular in some cases, sending off your team, your innovative team to some external place, like uh, some kind of, of function uh, or like Ideon in Loon, for instance, you can send there, you can work with other companies, get inspiration, but it's the same for the innovation lab, you lack the muscles. You might create some concepts, you might run some interesting tests, get customer feedback, but as soon as you're gonna scale it, you know, where are you going to get the money from? Who's going to make the decision? So there's a high risk that you will not succeed. However, if, it's, if you go for more like incremental innovation that will be integrated back into the core, it might be fine. Source innovation means that you sort of collaborate with an external partner so in order to, to, to really, really go all in in order to, cre to create uh, a new innovation that is more outside your existing core business. And you see, these different archetypes here relates also to the previous uh, model about where the hidden potential resides. If you should go for, for really a mobilizing mission, I think sourced mission might, might, sourced innovation might be, at least to some extent, be, be necessary. And one organization that I come across that I think could be categorized as sourced innovation is SRI International in Silicon Valley. Uh, they, are, they are, I mean, have been able to create a lot, several internet related innovations and they have sort of the, the a process for, for if you come there and ask, you know, I have this idea, do you think you have the tech that can help us addressing it? And they say, yeah, maybe we have our hidden potential. Uh, and they start exploring it, setting up a team, having a, a, like an 18 month process in order to go from the idea to a business concept and to see whether it's sort of has the potential to, to become something big or not. And if it doesn't have the potential, they will kill it. So this is how you can use the organize in different way. And I think any organization that has ambitions to, to sort of realize their hidden potential need to be really good at finding the organization in order to do it. Because you all know Edison invented the light bulb. What he did before he invented the light bulb was inventing the lab, right? So the organization always comes first. So you need to decide what type of organization are you willing to establish in order to become innovative, in order to, to realize your hidden potential. So if you would like to get ready in order to explore new businesses, remember that the organization is the vehicle of innovation. It is the organization that you create, whether it's a lab, uh, a small team, or a source innovation with, with an external partner whether you sort of work with external capital, et cetera, or not. But you need to think through how you're gonna work with it because otherwise you will start something and you, don't, you will end up not knowing what to do with the, 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 the results that you create. And I think as in the time we are in right now, it is time to start envision post-corona opportunities. We're going back to where we were some, some minutes ago talking about the megatrends. There are fantastic opportunities emerging right now. 
and you know just start thinking positively about what we can do and taking on those opportunities i think that is at least my best advice for two managers right now be optimistic see what hidden potential i have and start working on that and because if you don't do it there's a risk that you will be reactive instead of being proactive and gaining initiative in the markets that will evolve later on so as winston churchill said never never ever waste a good crisis and for you personally think about what is your hidden potential as individuals because you, you have that too right so how can you use it to achieve what you would like to do so that was it so that was i was planning to present andreas um do you have any questions Definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Matthias, for this fascinating presentation on how organizations can uh, unlock their hidden potentials. And the idea is that we now continue the uh, conversation with, with some questions from our participants. But I, I wanted to start off with um, uh, following up on, um, on your point regarding how organizations can organize themselves in order to unlock the hidden potential and i envision that at some point uh, this uh, this new initiatives that would be coming out uh, from from this skunk works or what uh, it may be uh, at some point have to go in into the wider business and the uh, business as usual in a way and it'd be interesting to hear your your thoughts on how how can an organization facilitate uh, that the transformation because I imagine there are questions in terms of organizations operations and also probably political questions internally and and how can companies achieve that in the best way I'm glad that you bring that question up because it is is, is often we often assume and uh, think that we that the the new business have created should be integrated back into to the core organization and sometimes that makes sense and sometimes when we start addressing the hidden potential or discovering new innovations, we see that they could, may not have the greatest potential somewhere out there, but actually within the core. So it's a way to strengthen the core. And that's one of the paradox that I've seen that if you, as soon as you're starting exploring new business opportunities outside the existing core, you will actually strengthen the core as a side effect. That's one thing. But as you are hinting at, uh, there are risks of actually killing the good results when you start integrating them. And that, 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 that's an obvious risk. And you, therefore, you need to be very careful if it makes sense to integrate them. Uh, one thing is to keep an eye on what KPIs are reasonable for, 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 for the new business. What is its business model? And there are research showing that the most successful like business innovation initiatives are the ones who don't care much about comparing the new business business model with the existing ones they give it freedom to explore its own business model and then later on when it has become established and has enough muscles itself you know uh, you have a functional business model you're being able to deliver a values for customers you have a revenue model, making sure you're, you're, you're making money, um, at least having a positive cash flow, etc. So once those things are in place, you can start asking yourself, does this really fit with the core? Okay, and then how? Because if you start off, you know, after a six month half, or a year or so, thinking this small product could be part, you're, you will easily kill it. So you need to protect it. And then you might see that this should never be integrated. We should make an exit and sell it or it should be like the amazon super case illustrates it should become a division instead so so you need to keep those different uh, options open and just one more example how it could work like a friend of mine he was working for this um uh, forestry company um paper and pulp company they started up this uh, project with exploring uh, how, how how could we utilize our 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 products in like in improving the logistics of, of like of groceries in order to sort of control the humidity during transports etc so they gradually moved into the sort of transportation logistics industry 
but it was still a small project, you know, making some millions. So it was nothing compared to the multi-billion business that they had in the core. But that opened up for new thinking in the company. And they realized, you know, maybe this whole logistics business and utilizing our, our, hit, our, our, our core capacity in other settings has huge potential that we have never been thinking of before. So they saw new opportunities and that led to the, uh, an acquisition journey instead. They bought like an American company, integrated that into to, as a division or part of a division, but which have grown now from like some millions of revenue with this project that was sort of uh, a strange thing in large organization to actually like a million, billion sec revenue on an annual basis. So I think it's an interesting example of what might happen if you sort of start off working with your hidden potential and being open for different end solutions, so to speak, yeah, and uh, even including acquisition or, or, or other companies. Long answer to a, a short question. It's interesting. It's, it's a big topic. Uh, we got another question that um, uh, is, is probably a little bit further up uh, upstream in the process, um, but uh, I think it probably builds on the example you provided with auto leave and uh, kind of considering how organizations are increasingly value-led or, or mission-driven mm. uh, exactly how does the mission play a role in in this process of unlocking the hidden potential and we think more broadly about the company's mission uh, and not necessarily related to sort of the the, the mission for all of a mobilizing mission in order to realize the hidden potential because many companies have a fantastic mission in itself already uh, as in it's a good starting point i think because it's it's you in in a way you can see that if if you have a broad mission you you're also you're you have in a good position to be flexible about seeing what you can do and and obviously as a orderly the example that you're referring to here they have a broad, if you have the mission of saving lives, well, what could be included in that? Lots of different things, which open up in itself for creativity. But in compared to if you had a narrow mission, which means that you were sort of tied in what you can do. So I think mission is, is an important starting point. Uh, but it's also more like on a deeper, more fundamental level, I think that if you have like a, a mission to really accomplish something, which is not some kind of, you know, a phrase that you have because you should have a mission, but a mission that actually means something. Uh, it's also a way to sort of mobilizing, motivating people, uh, opening up for seeing new opportunities. And, and, and one example that pops up in my mind is that um, some 10, plus, well, 15 years ago, Vattenfall at that time, you know, a Swedish electricity company, they had this mission that they should contribute to a more sustainable society, which might sound like a contradiction in turn because they were making coal, buying coal plants in Poland, but never mind, they were sort of balancing those two at that time. And that meant that at that time, engineers were starting thinking, you know, what should we do given the mission of contributing to sustainable society? And, and once, you know, a group of people said, you know, electric cars would probably, you know, be something for the future. Uh, so maybe we should, uh, you know, pull up, uh, collaborate with Volvo or Saab, who was still around at that time, in order to sort of see how, how we can support that. But by the way, we will sell more electricity. electricity. Uh, so it all made sense from their own um, perspective. And so they, they contacted the, the car companies and eventually it became a collaboration with Volvo they were investing together with Volvo, and that became sort of the starting point for what later on become the, the diesel plug-in uh, hybrids for Volvo, which sort of helped Volvo to, to get a, a good position in, in, in more like hybrid com uh, cars. So this is one example of how we actually can use the mission in order to move into a new area. Thank you, yeah. I, uh... Actually, we, uh, I'm, go I'm going to jump back to, to the previous topic we had because uh, uh, we, we got a follow-up question that uh, yeah. I think is really interesting um, that uh, uh, I think is, is helping us taking a step back and then actually uh, ask ourselves uh, why is it important for organizations to innovate in the first place uh, if then the successful innovations are sold off and 
to some extent, uh, you could maybe argue that they should uh, not just focus on exploitation uh, rather than waste uh, to some extent time and money on uncertain outcomes outside of the core business itself. Well, I mean, I think the obvious answer, if you should go down that road for commercial companies, that you can find a way to make money. Uh, or, so, so that's the bottom line, of course. Otherwise, it, it will not fit. So if you also can make a contribution to society, I think it's a benefit and will be increasingly so, not the least when it comes to recruiting new people or, or, or being appear as, as relevant or, or acceptable by society at large. For instance, the whole trend now with IKEA investing in, in, in really trying to be CO2 positive, which is a stretch, right? And we're creating a real circle of business model, etc. by 2030, which is an example of a company mission driven, going for a circle of business model, which have fantastic impact on, on retail for, for all those who will be influenced by IKEA's efforts. Uh, but coming back to your question, why should you do it uh, or, you know, some kind of risk? Well, one example is sort of if you're in a position that you will be integrated under the platforms, well, you can take the choice and wait and see what happens. Uh, or you will take a fight and see if you can take a position in the new markets emerging. So it depends a little bit on your attitude and your strategy, I think, uh, on what you like to become as a company long term. Uh, and then the negative side, you say, you're going to take us on risk, we're doing well today. And then the question is, oh, do you think you're going to do well tomorrow too? Or do you need to sort of add something to your current portfolio? Uh, and, and if the answer is no to that, well, maybe you shouldn't do it then because you're making money where you are. But anyway, if you see that you have some hidden potential, then the next question is, should we take huge risk in investing that? that? And I, my take on that is that you don't have to take much risk. Because if you know how to organize for business innovation and you work with an experimental approach, taking a stepwise approach, testing hypotheses and building it gradually, and do not start investing a lot in the new cases unless they have proven themselves on the market. I mean, you're not exposing yourself to much risk in that case. It's controlled risk. You only commit yourself like a quarter at a time, for instance. So it's not large amounts of money. So it should be, and then again, the money you're pouring in should be relative to the money that you have as a company. But if you're on the one, if you don't believe in the future, uh, I mean, what kind of company are you then? So I think that, it, that what, what, what constrains many companies is that was sort of the last part of your question is that they're afraid it's going to be super expensive, it's super high risk. But I think if you look closer to the so, to a successful example is that it does not have to be that case. <laughs> and uh, just one example, like uh, 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 in Sweden, is a weather uh, um, meteorological uh, organization. They have this new business innovation organization, and they have two cri uh, one criteria if they before they start investing uh, is that that they, they they should have two paying customers. So the mm -hmm. ultimate proof is money coming in in an early phase of the development. Otherwise, they don't go for it. And they have been able to create really interesting new businesses out of the da weather data they have, just as an example. And by the way, one final thing. Since we're mo moving with digitalization into a world with more and more data, right? It's also more easy to experiment with data, uh, business models related to data, back compared to a sort of com if you need to build a, a paper mill, for instance, which automatically means a billion uh, sick or, or, or dollar investment, right? So need to manage, know how to manage it, then you can control, control the risk and go for the opportunities. Yeah, and I, I assume that it's also, of course, uh, a function of um, uh, what time horizon we apply uh, to these questions and, and to some extent how much the uh, our environment <laughs> is changing. Yeah. But could you talk us through, uh, because I think it's related to this question, uh, what the time frame for these processes are? How, how long does this take? Going from idea to a, a big successful operation. Example. I mean, obviously it is on one hand side completely impossible to answer that question. Uh, but if we can show, uh, maybe I could elaborate a little bit on it. I think that if you look at some cases, in, in some, I think that 12, 18, perhaps 24 months, 
for going from idea to, to having tested a new business model to see whether it, it, it makes sense or not, whether it's worthwhile investing a little bit more in it in order to sort of setting up a more permanent team. Um, so so th that's one time horizon to give, give you a sense of that. But obviously that varies between the different contexts. So, so this is just you know, some rule of thumb perhaps. Uh, so it's very context dependent. That is one thing. It can be faster, it can take longer time. Uh, but then going from something small to like, you know, uh, several billion revenue business, well, again, it depends on the context. If we definitely, in most cases, talk several years, of course. In some cases, maybe five, maybe 10 years, sometimes even longer. So then that goes back to the time horizon that you have uh, and how urgent it is for the company. So it depends on the case, it depends on the situation, it depends also on the industry you're in, right? Some industries have much shorter cycle times when it comes to development compared to others that, that you know, five years is nothing. So it's relative. And, but at the end of the day, I think it comes back to the, to the patience of the investors, of the owners. Yeah. The, 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 that's absolutely critical, I think. And that's maybe, that's why we see like a private loan company like IKEA are able to take a, such a, a super ambitious effort like becoming CO2 positive within 10 years. Could you take, uh, can you do that if you're a publicly traded company? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it, it's, it takes some leadership and committed board, etc. So it, 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 um, it's, it's not, you know, it's impossible to give a straight uh, easy answer, but we need to reflect on that, I think, and see what is possible to do in the context where we are and starting there and see what can we do where we are and, and acting on, on those opportunities that, that we have. It's not like uh, either, uh, either way or it, 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 it's, it depends. Thank you. Um, we got a question also uh, focusing in on autonomy, uh, and as you mentioned, that being a major factor uh, behind innovation and realizing the hidden potential. And mm. the question is, uh, how about autonomy in general among employees? Uh, in combination with enabling transparent communication and collaboration between employees and partners. I think that is really, really interesting question because it opens up if you have uh, people being uh, autonomous in the sense that they can, you have some space to think freely, to act freely, if you have sort of uh, those opportunities in the workplace, it opens up for not the least realizing the hidden potential close to the core and taking small steps, adding like new features, new applications, coming up with tweaks of the existing business models, like what is popularly referred to as like adjacent innovations, right? So, 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 and so the culture that you have, the freedom that you give to people uh, have impact on that, I think. Uh, so, 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 I mean, you don't, it depends again on how radical and how ambitious innovations you would like to go for. If you're more interested in sort of adjacent businesses, stretching the core a little bit, um, you can, could work with projects like small projects, perhaps using innovation lab. Uh, so in some rare cases, skunk works. Uh, giving people freedom to experiment, coming up with new ideas. So, so, so you need sort of so, to see this as a portfolio of alternatives, how you can use it. It depends again on what kind of organization you are and what you would like to achieve. So, so the, you, being skilled at picking the right tools, as I said, is, is, is the key. Great. And as a last question uh, that, that we got in here, um, it's it regarding the, uh, the duality that you mentioned uh, from exploitation and versus exploration mm. and uh, uh, how that fits in with efficiency versus effectiveness. Uh, would you agree that there is a connection there? Um, no, I think I see the question, but it's, it's not necessarily because efficiency I mean, that's an internal processes. Effectiveness refers to the outcome we'd like to achieve. And that is something that is absolutely crucial for exploitation and for what we do in the core too. While, um, for the, for, but the same story goes for, 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 for exploration too. The, but there are other measurements of efficiency and other uh, uh, measurements of effectiveness. So those are more sort of economic terms 
referring to processes and outcomes rather than uh, per se uh, exploration and exploitation, I think. But it's a good question. I haven't really thought about that connection b before, but this is sort of my spontaneous answer to that. Okay, thank you. Um, since um, uh, we've been talking about the hidden potential, if you sort of find this interesting, uh, it's actually possible to pre-order the book today. I received a link to bookers.com uh, this morning, so it's possible to pre-order the book, and the book will be available on August 7. And in case you would like to connect on LinkedIn, um, send me a text message, you know, if you have some follow-up questions, this is how, where you can find me. Okay. Thanks for the questions that you have sort of uh, communicated through Andreas. Great, I'd like to, to thank uh, all of our speakers for their input and a big thank you to you all for joining today's webinar. We hope that you have found it uh, to be engaging and interesting. So before we end the webinar, I'd like to just share a few comments about the future. So we are all facing challenges during these uncertain times and the Stockholm School of Economics is no exception. That's why we're lucky to have a supportive network of alumni such as yourselves to lean on. So if you are interested in ABLE, we ask for you to consider getting involved in one or more of the following ways. First, provide your feedback about what types of webinars and activities you would like to see in the future so that we can offer relevant and continuous learning opportunities for you. Second, if you have a job or an internship that you might want to offer to an SSC student, let us know. As you can imagine, jobs and internships are more difficult to come by for our students and new graduates. Third, you can consider signing up to be a mentor to an SSC master's student. As a mentor, you can be located anywhere in the world and the mentorship program will begin in September. And finally, we ask that you consider making a financial contribution to SSC to support our research and teaching. SSC will face a reduction in income in the coming year from the lack of tuition fees from international students and support from companies. So in order to remain the high quality institution that you know, we ask that you consider donating whatever you can. And this can be done at hhs.se support. Thank you again for your engagement and support, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at the next webinar. Bye-bye.